May. I'm Danny Seabright, president of the US UAE Business Council. Good morning to friends in the United States. Uh, good afternoon and evening to uh, our friends in the UAE. Um, welcome to today's discussion about Abu Dhabi's growing role uh, with regard to global tech and its growing ecosystem in this uh, sector and space. Over the next hour, we will hear directly from the organizations at the helm of driving economic diversification in Abu Dhabi through innovation, entrepreneurship, and public-private collaboration. I'm delighted to be joined once again by His Excellency, Dr. Tarek Ben-Hindi, Director General of ADIO. I'm also pleased to be joined by a panel of important stakeholders in Abu Dhabi's tech ecosystem. We have Nader Mustif, head of uh, particip participants, if you will, at Hub 71, which is located at uh, its leading financial free zone of Abu Dhabi Global Markets. We have Ro Roberto Croci, Managing Director of Microsoft for Startups. Allison Dilworth, who's the Acting Deputy Chief of Mission at the US Embassy in Abu Dhabi is joining us. And Yahya Akel, CEO of, and co-founder of OMENT. Today, we have over 300 registered guests from the US UAE business community, government, acad and academia on this webinar. I will remind our guests that this webinar is being live streamed and it will be recorded and posted uh, on YouTube. Throughout the webinar, please submit any questions throughout the, through the Q&A or chat functions and we'll monitor those. We will begin today's webinar uh, with the conversation featuring Dr. Ben Hindi. I also want to note that uh, U.S. states represented on the webinar today are Alabama, Iowa, and Nebraska. Journalists are also in attendance from Reuters and The National. And we have government representation, of course, from the U.S., from the UAE Embassy in Washington, D.C., from the UAE Consulate in New York, uh, the Embassy of Israel in Washington, D.C., the Israel National Cyber Directorate, NASA, the U.S. Commercial Service, and the U.S. Department of State will all be in attendance today. Uh, Dr. Uh, ben Hindi is the Director General of the Abu Dhabi Investment Office, which is in, in an incredibly important game-changing institution supporting investment in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. He will be key to realizing the Ministry of Economy's goal of doubling did you hear that? Doubling the number of U.S. companies in the UAE over the next 10 years. Dr. Tarek is well positioned to do so as he has more than 18 years of experience in asset management, private equity, and investment banking. Prior to his current position, Dr. Tarek held various roles at Emirates NBD, Commercial Bank of, of Dubai, Mubadala, Citigroup, Dubai Holding, Delta Airlines, and UPS. Dr. Tarek holds a PhD in economics from Imperial College London, as well as graduate degrees from Columbia University and the London Business School. I should note that he has a strong affinity to the United States from the time that he has spent there, particularly in the state of Georgia. And if you didn't know better, you would think he was an American by the way he speaks. So with that, Dr. Tarek, over to you and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Danny. I, uh... I'm not sure if I should blush or if I should ask you to like kind of streamline that introduction next time because it's, uh, it's very kind, very generous of you. I also want to say uh, thank you to the U.S. Embassy, to OMIT, to Microsoft, to Hub71, and especially to the U.S. UAE Business Council for putting this together and for all these important people to be there on this call so that we can actually showcase every part of the ecosystem that we're trying to tackle. And I think that's an important part of what it is that we're trying to do is that we're trying to build partnerships, relationships, and not work on transactions. We want this to be long-term. And as such, it's an iterative process with how it is that we're going to take this from where we are today, being relatively nascent with some great successes under our belt already to having a full-blown, full-fledged entrepreneurial ecosystem covering every aspect of that, that, that environment and the ecosystem that's required to be there. And the only way that we're going to do that is through partnerships and through engaging with our global partners 
which is why we're on this call today, because the US is an incredibly important market for us. It's one of the oldest relationships that we have in the 50 year history of the UAE. And it's one of the strongest relationships that we have. And we think that's an incredibly powerful tool and baseline to start from with how it is that we engage with the US market. Now, we have recently announced that we're opening a few international locations, two of which will be in the States. I won't tell you guys where yet, but what we're trying to do is we need to have boots on the ground so that we can engage directly with the ecosystems in certain cities around the world. But when I look at the US and I look at what's been created in some of the major cities, the secondary cities, and even the tertiary cities, we can take a lot of lessons from what has been created there, whether it's Silicon Valley or Austin or Atlanta, New York, DC, they're all doing different things and they're all catering to different needs. But fundamentally what they're addressing is that they're providing the right type of opportunity. They're putting the right type of support behind creating those opportunities. And they're making sure that they're engaged with the people that are starting those businesses. And that's an incredibly important recipe for making this successful. We're trying to do the same today. So today we're looking at how it is that we can run programs with our partners in Abu Dhabi, such as Hub 71, to try to drive that engagement with startups, with the private sector, to really then push forward on our, our mission. We then have companies like Omit that we are working with that will benefit from financial incentives as well as the non-financial support. And then we look at what we've recently announced with Microsoft in terms of the various programs that they have, some of which are being created and, and localized for our market and our region, hosted out of Abu Dhabi, is going to create some immense change here. But what's important is that we make sure that the narrative as well as the execution match. We need to make sure that we are negating some of the perceptions that exist about the region and what it is that this region has to offer. And ultimately go back to that whole discussion around how do I build a partnership, even if it, had, if it ebbs and flows in terms of the type of partnership, but it needs to be long-term and it needs to be resilient. And that's what it is that we're trying to build. So again, the US provides an immense amount of opportunity for companies in the US to come to Abu Dhabi and access the region from here. And we look to facilitate that here at the investment office. We provide that access. We look at how it is that we can simplify processes. We look at various support mechanisms that we can offer. And really what we believe that we distinguish ourselves with is consistency. Now, some of that is an iterative process as I was talking to the, this group before we went live and hello to everyone on this webinar as well as those of you on YouTube, is that it is an iterative process. We have to make sure that we are addressing uh, the various problems that exist for companies in the specific need that they may have in terms of growth into the region, but also some of the policies and recommendations that we need to take forward to leadership to actually change things. And this is where it's an incredibly powerful recipe for how it is that we're going to be successful. We want to make sure that we're taking that feedback, that we're passing it up, and that every startup, every company, whether they be a multinational or a pre-seed institution or will, what will ultimately be an institution have a seat at the table at our transformation and the journey over the next five to 20 years of what it is that we're trying to establish. So I'll stop there, Danny. Again, I just want to say thank you. I think that um, we've done, we've had some incredible success recently with Anrami and some of the major announcements that we've had that demonstrate that not only is this region ripe for the opportunity that exists here, but I think there's a lot of disruption and constructive disruption that can occur here by U.S. companies looking to expand and deploy their technology in a new region and we're there to help them. Dr. Tarek, thank you very much. Let's start big and, and come down a little bit. You know, what, what are, from your perspective, what are the top advantages that Abu Dhabi offers startups, uh, broadly speaking, compared to coming to Abu Dhabi as opposed to going somewhere else in the world? Great question. I get faced with that question. And let's forget the rest of the world. Let's just look at the region, right? Every country and cities within countries are vying for that startup hub. But I don't think that this is a question of having one dominant hub and then everyone else sort of being a secondary market. I think that we can create these hubs around the region. I mean, look at the demographics of our region, Dan, right? It's, it's dominated by youth. These are people that are looking to either create opportunity or be a part of opportunities that are being created by others. So we have to create these platforms. We have to make sure that the government is supporting these various initiatives and, and, and actually backing this up and demonstrating that they are taking the lead. You know, there's a common 
phrase that I've heard in, in Silicon Valley from time to time, and that is that everybody wants to be first to be second in terms of the risk and in terms of the appetite there. I think what governments are showing here in the region, and if you look at what Abu Dhabi has been able to accomplish, is that we're being first to be first. And that's, that carries with it a lot of risk. But that's why we're building partnership models, and we're not looking at this from a transaction perspective. We want to make sure that we are covering every aspect if, of a startup's journey and the people that want to call Abu Dhabi home from start to end, the end being the next project that they start and the project after that and so on and so forth. Now, with startups in general, you know, there is a high failure rate, but what we're trying to do is de-risk that failure rate. So here in Abu Dhabi, we've got some serious financial firepower that's going behind backing a lot of these startups to de-risk the financial failure component. What we're designing and building now, and we have in place with certain institutions but that we want to amplify, is how do we help companies with their back office? If they can't hire people or source talent fast enough, how can we support them with being able to accomplish that? How do we help them engage and, and generate revenue streams that they might be looking at, even at a very early stage? We've built that into the system now, and we're starting to roll that out. It's working very well in some of the core focus sectors that we have, and those revolve around agriculture, healthcare, ICT, which isn't a sector but covers everything, um, but specific areas within ICT. Uh, we're looking at travel and tourism. We're looking at the financial services sector. So all of these are where we're doubling down on, on, on the financial incentives, but everyone is welcome in Abu Dhabi. And I think that when you look at the balance between the standard of living, the safety and security, the fact that we cater to, to everyone at whatever stage in life that they're at or through the journey of stages in life, we have that here. Now we're providing that immense firepower to help them realize their long-term aspirations with the businesses that they're starting um, and hopefully we'll continue to start here in Abu Dhabi. It's interesting that you comment or you say that the importance uh, the, the critical to creating this new ecosystem in Abu Dhabi is the public-private partnership model. And then you referenced uh, Silicon Valley. There might be some companies in Silicon Valley that just prefer the US government to just stay out of what they do and not get involved at all. Uh, but but you know, you're creating something brand new there. You're, you're, you're doing something that's never been done before. And you're also doing it, as you rightly pointed out, in a region where others want to do it as well. Um, say a few more words about competition uh, elsewhere in the region in doing this, uh, whether it's just up the road in Dubai or in Saudi Arabia or Qatar or wherever it is. How do you view what you're doing at, at, at Hub 71 and with Audio uh, as a, and how does it fit into the broader region? So it's a simple formula for me personally, Danny, with the way that I look at this, is that if there's no competition, you become complacent. And if you become complacent, you revel in mediocrity. And that is an immense danger to any, any economy is that you end up reveling in, in, in your mediocrity in terms of what you have already accomplished. So I think what competition does for us, one is it keeps us on our toes, but it also helps us realize that there are certain policies that we have in place that people are catching up to us on. And then there are other areas that we might need to facilitate based on feedback that we're getting from the private sector. So this is that push-pull relationship that we have today that we're trying to build. So when I look at policies that need reform, for example, with what people are trying to accomplish with a, their particular business, let's look at digital assets, for example. It's a new space everywhere on a global level. So how is it that we can create an environment here, set ourselves apart from the rest of the world and make sure that this becomes the launch pad for every digital asset platform that wants to grow and thrive. So we have to look at this on a case by case basis, depending on the sector that they're coming in. We have to look at how advanced that sector is and how it is that we can help it grow. But ultimately the competition is keeping us, um, you know, really, really engaged at every level whether it be policy or whether it be the private sector and what it is that they need from an economic perspective. And so that, that, that works really in our favor. And I think that when you look at what we've created and the environment that we've created, now it's about just building the density. All the pieces are there. And we want companies from the US to come in and look at these public private partnerships, whether it be infrastructure or soft infrastructure and come in and participate in that growth and that development. Well, and it's really important uh, when you talk about what you've created, uh, for the overall ecosystem. You've focused on the business aspects, but the Abu Dhabi and the UAE have created a tolerant, accepting, welcoming nation where 
people want to come and live their lives and and work and and send their kids to school uh, and and have a have a life there. So that's that's all part of the broader uh, pool, if you will, of this important ecosystem. So congratulations to you, sir, and and what you're doing there in that regard. Um, let's just focus. We're the USUE Business Council, so let's just focus a little bit on the U.S. Um, what, what give, give us just a little flavor of U.S. companies that you have there already in the various verticals that they're in, where you want to see more U.S. companies uh, coming uh, in the future to Adio, and that you want to work with them to help. Give us a little sense of that, please. So I'll start by saying that every sector is an important sector for us, and companies that are looking to use innovation to drive transformation within those sectors are important uh, you know, counterparts and, and, and partnerships that we want to build. And again, I'm saying this being very real about the opportunities that exist here. I'm not trying to sound cliche here with, with giving a narrative and not then being able to execute and deliver on that narrative. Today, when I look at the sectors, especially in the US around the areas that we are focused on, they've got it all covered, whether it be biotechnology, whether it be ag tech, whether it be financial services, there's a lot of creativity coming out of the US now, some of it might need to be localized for the region, right? Whether it be a language requirement, whether it might be, you know, traditional banking needing to apply Sharia components, so on and so forth. But there's still that massive opportunity to take existing infrastructure that's been built in the U.S. through these startups and, and even multinationals and apply it here in a slightly tweaked manner. And I think the institutions that actually approach us now, that come in at this point in time where the government is backing this at every single level, are going to be the ones that have that seat at the table over the long term in terms of driving policy change. So we're working with startups in the US. We've, we've worked, and, and this is public knowledge, we've engaged with quite a few US uh, companies, some of which have signed up here and now actively operating on the ground or building out their infrastructure here. You know, if I look at Microsoft, uh, I think it's fair, Roberto, for me to say that that's a U.S. company, right? If I, it's a global company, but if you look at Microsoft and you know the program that we launched with them and a few other companies that we're working with that I can't name yet, um, it's really, really exciting in terms of not just building on a particular transaction that occurs at the at, at that time but really it's, it's helping to drive the engagement at every single level in the economy, Danny. And I think if you look at US companies, irrespective of their size or where they are in their uh, you know, stage of development, all of them wanna participate with the universities. They wanna provide this exposure to youth. They wanna make sure that they're engaging with the wider ecosystem. It's a very US centric way of approaching <laughs> business. And we like that model. We wanna make sure that we deploy that model here and that we apply it to the various sectors that we have here. And I think that that U.S. mindset with what it is that we've put in place to really facilitate that type of growth and development is a really great formula for helping U.S. companies uh, thrive here. Sounds fantastic. Uh, we're going to ask you one more question and, and then go to our panel. Um, you know, if you had to paint a picture of, you know, what this is going to look like five years from now, uh, 10 years from now down the road, what, what would you say, uh, what, what would you say, how would you describe that to, to our listeners? And then also, I always ask this question of folks like you, sir, because you are visionary. What keeps you up at night and what do you worry about preventing you from executing on reaching that vision, that, you're, that picture that you're going to paint for us for what 10 years from now is going to look like? So I'll start with the second question, because what keeps me up at night is talking to everybody on the West coast in the u.s time to be up at night, right so we'll go with that no i mean in all in all seriousness what really keeps me up at night is that we've got so much interest because we've created this right uh panel for how it is that people are getting exposed to what abu Dhabi has to offer is that i want to cater to all that demand today right so the biggest risk here is that or what keeps me up at night is that I'm not going to be able to execute on every single one of the uh, the companies that come in and, and, and do it as efficiently as I would like to, right? It's, it's just a question of resourcing and a question of how it is that we execute. What we have found is that a lot of the companies that we engage with typically don't need any financial support, right? So what they're asking for is access to the market. That's very easy for us to provide. They want you know to be introduced to various institutions here in Abu Dhabi, public and private. That's very simple for us to to do. We run a process for anyone that benefits the from the financial incentives and that requires time. But those things don't keep me up at night. It's really, I want to cater to all of the demand 
as efficiently, effectively, and quickly as possible. And I wanna make sure that the information that we are getting from all these companies satisfies the requirements so we can move it at the speed that we would like to move it at. Now, five to 20 years from now, if I just look at the baseline with what all the various entities in, in Abu Dhabi are doing today, the government initiatives as well as from the private sector, you look at the Disrupt AD announcement that just came out recently. Over the next three years, they're talking about a thousand startups. So if I look at uh, supporting a thousand startups, if I look at this over the next five years, you're probably looking at two, three, four thousand startups being supported in Abu Dhabi through various mechanisms, various programs, and various initiatives. I think that's incredibly important in that once they, they set foot in Abu Dhabi, that they get the right support. But what's going to be very important over a 20-year period is that all of those companies get the right type of support throughout their journey, whether they fail at their series A or whether they get to that series E late stage funding and that we're able to provide the right platform for them with publicly listing their businesses, with, with you know, being able to uh, sell their businesses. And, and I think you're going to end up with a very active market in that sense, in terms of what we are creating here. And ultimately what this all revolves around Danny is making sure that people that call Abu Dhabi home call Abu Dhabi home for the rest of their lives. It's long-term for us. Again, you see the policy changes recently around visas and, 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 and some of the, the, the announcements that have come out. This is really big for us in terms of making sure that we create that stickiness here. And we're only going to create that stickiness here if we have the right programs, but we have the right partners that are here for the right reason, that really want to grow and help develop this region. Because I think that there's immense amounts of opportunity here with the, the number of youth and with this untapped business potential that's here, that's just waiting to be done. And, and US companies are ripe for taking advantage of that in the region. Sir, I've been traveling to the UAE, to Abu Dhabi and Dubai and the other Emirates since the, the 90s. And I can tell you, you've created stickiness uh, big time. And uh, there's a lot of people that I talk to in the world that would love the opportunity and chance to have a career makeover and live in the UAE today. So congratulations to you and, and the wise leadership there for, for all of that. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your insight. Your work at Audio is truly impressive. And I like look forward to seeing what is to come. And I look forward to seeing it up close and personal when we can all travel again very, very soon, hopefully. So, sir, thank you for that. And with that, we'll turn to our panel. Hey, Danny, do you mind if I stay on for the panel? I'm happy to participate on the panel. Uh, please, uh, you please, want, so. please yeah. you're, you're mostly welcome. David will keep you on and not, not kick you out. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce again, uh, Nader Mastif, who's the head of partnerships at Hub71. Again, Abu Dhabi's leading global tech ecosystem, Hal's situated, partnered with Abu Dhabi Global Markets, very, very important partner, member of our council as well. Robert Croce, managing director of Microsoft for Startups, uh, also a member of the council, uh, free global program to get dedicated to helping B2B startups successfully scale their companies. My colleague and friend, Allison Dilworth, acting deputy chief of mission at the US Embassy in Abu Dhabi, and Yahya Akel, co-founder and CEO of OMET, a medical marketplace that helps manufacturers, distributors, and healthcare providers to exchange data and meet demand. Thank you all for joining us today. Nader, Roberto, Allison, Yahya, I'm gonna jump right in here. Let's discuss the advantages of doing business in Abu Dhabi from your perspectives. In the past few decades, Abu Dhabi's grown, it's flourished, it's, it's growing into a tech hub. Can each of you share um, just a minute or two each your, your, your thoughts on the benefits of startups that startups can find in Abu Dhabi? And we'll just start with Nader and go down the way I introduced you, please. Go ahead, Nader. Thank you, Dan. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, look, I think, I think Abu Dhabi and the UAE, historically, 50 years plus, have, have always been open for business, right? The, the whole idea of UAE is about exchange, is about uh, reaching out to, to neighbors, and, and of course, further than that, to, to get trade uh, relationships, to get partnerships, to get investments, and, and, and just make sure that the relationships uh, of Abu Dhabi and the UAE are based on a global level. So, you know, you see that from the trade links that the UAE established, again, um, from the last century, up to now where you see a bustling place, very diverse, very open, very multicultural and very ambitious at the same time. 
So, so you know, you, you asked me what, you know, what are the benefits of being here? I think you, you, you're you getting a platform where you have the, or some of the best infrastructure globally, right? One, which is, you know, sometimes we take it for granted, but it's it's quite important. And then, and then you find the willingness to host and help businesses thrive um, in a way that benefits, um, of course, clearly the local economy, but as well the the the, 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 the foreign investments and and the, and the talent that comes in and looks for uh, future and looks for potential in, in, in Abu Dhabi. So you know you look at how how well centered we are geographically, you know, among amongst the the, the world, uh, the the talent we have, the resources that want to live here and work here, um, and 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 contribute to the economy. And then you look at the, the programs and infrastructure that's built for businesses like ours. And I'm speaking now from Hubsa to one angle to see, you know, we want to attract founders, we want to attract entrepreneurs to be here. So what do these guys want? And Dr. Tariq alluded to that. They want access to funds. They want access to market. They want to be able to host and thrive and, and upskill and grow their talent base. And they want an environment to operate in, with, whether it's legal, um, or a regulatory. And that's why, for example, again, from a Hub 71 point of view, we exist in the ADGM uh, jurisdiction, a, a very progressive international financial center, um, really keen and designed uh, to attract as much uh, activity as possible, to attract funds, to attract startups, corporates, and give them that environment to transact, to grow, and to, to, to do what they want to do on a regional basis. So again, it's you have to look at the UAE as a regional hub. You have to look at the UAE as a place where people come in. Yes, you do business in the UAE and there's a very big market, but it was also a fantastic door opener for the region and beyond. So that's that's why we try to position our programs and, and as Hub 71, as a global launchpad, as a global platform, come establish that up, but then you, you know the world is your is your uh, oyster. Nader, thank you. We're gonna turn to Roberto, but Roberto, you're already promoting uh, entrepreneurship for the younger generation. I see you have your son there by your side learning uh, what, what needs to be done. Go ahead, why, you know, tell us about how it is to be in Abu Dhabi and why Microsoft is there the way you are. Yeah, absolutely, and sorry, I mean, they're, they're here around and uh, yeah, they will be hired very soon in the team. Um, <laughs> no, look, uh, it's, uh, for me, uh, uh, I just want to try to add to the points that have been already uh, uh, touched upon. And I think it all starts with culture and leadership. So what startups can find in Abu Dhabi is, is exactly uh, that long-term vision that Dr. Tarek uh, was mentioning uh, uh, before. Um, I, I had the unique chance to present some ideas to him and I found this fast forward thinking and uh, open minded to, to really challenge even the ideas and, and uh, sit down and, and discuss, uh, you know, how this would have impact the ecosystem here in the long term, right? So, and you don't find this, uh, you know, everywhere in, in this region. So Abu Dhabi is unique in leading the way, in my opinion, when it comes to culture and leadership, looking long term to invest ahead of time in those initiatives that can really make an impact. Um, you mentioned before this, this Silicon Valley mindset. I don't think the ecosystem here should copy the Silicon Valley because it's a very different ecosystem, right? There are, there are definitely lessons learned that, that the ecosystem here can inspire to, but, but the ecosystem should, should leverage the, those unique assets that uh, you, you know, make it very relevant and, and unique uh, and differentiated here in this part of the world. But still, that mindset is important. So you mentioned before youth, and you mentioned my son. Uh, we, we have some of the programs that we will probably discuss later. We are looking into uh, you know, how we can really inspire this mindset in youth here. Because uh, if you look at the broader region, uh, it's true that a lot of countries have a younger population. And this is the best hope for the future, right? If we are able to provide them world-class support, we are able to provide them technology skilling, we are able to give them the opportunity to thrive and to fail and to thrive again and to make uh, wrong decisions and then right decisions, right? So they, I see all of this is unique in Abu Dhabi. The other thing is uh, representing, uh, you know, Microsoft, I would say, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity with cloud and, and technology in general. So, uh, which, which, which is massive. If you think, uh, uh, you know, our uh, general manager Sayed uh, recently announced that by 2024, uh, you know, uh, we are expecting new revenues from cloud services around $27 billion here in the UAE, 
uh, and those creating uh, 69,000 jobs, right? So there is there is impact on on uh, uh, social impact and impact on the economic growth of of the country, and that impacts the startups as well. Uh, you know the the fact that you can have a secure, reliable environment where you can build you know your your tech solution, your products here. Uh, you know, all compliant and all safe, uh, uh, and and scale your products from here, is key. I I liked the, the fact that uh, before it has been stressed a lot uh, the concept of partnership because it's the same principles by which Microsoft work. We we operate mainly through partnership. If you think about uh, for every single dollar that Microsoft generate uh, cloud based uh, generated revenues, basically we are able to enable uh, our partner network to make, uh, as of today, uh, six, uh, $6, and we expect this to grow to $7.7 uh, by 2024. So there is a real, real value, real impact that we can enable through partnership. And for us, startups are also partners. Uh, because by definition, startups are trying to, to solve real problems. They're trying to leverage tech as a means to an end to scale uh, their solution, to scale their product. Um, and we are there to support with that. So the investment Microsoft did here in the region in Abu Dhabi uh, with local data centers is really massive, is really important. And, and with that investment comes also the access, access to markets because uh, Microsoft is a global brand, is a US company, um, but is a global brand, right? So enabling startups to tap into markets where we also have a presence, right? And we can enable our partner network or our presence in that market for a startup to scale, enter new markets, uh, get in front of corporates or enterprises when it comes to B2B, B2B solutions, for example, is key to secure them, for example, important deals is key in that phase where they need to grow and, okay. and then increase their valuation and increase them the chances to, to be successful. Okay, okay, thank you. That's fantastic. And maybe if, maybe if uh, um, uh, Silicon Valley is not the model, maybe Seattle is, is, a, is a better model for the UAE to be looking at. Okay. Allison is in Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> Allison, you've been on the ground now with your family two years or three years. I've, I've tried to remember. It seems like you've been there for a long time. A little bit, a little bit in between, almost three. Almost three. So, so from your perspective, I mean, I'm going to ask you a little bit later about uh, U.S. companies, but from your perspective of living and working in Abu Dhabi, uh, tell just give us a sense of the of the flavor for you. Yeah, oh, absolutely happy to. Danny, thanks for the opportunity. You know, I've been I've been covering these issues in the in the region for about twenty years, and I love to talk about um, Abu Dhabi. And it's uh, it's just a dream to be the um, economic counselor. Is my day job here, even though I'm the acting DCM right now, because um, Abu Dhabi learns. Right, um, Abu Dhabi takes the the time and and makes it important to figure out what is uh, working in an ecosystem and what is not and what they need to change uh, in order to make it work, right? So working with, with Tarek and with Audio has just been fabulous because we've seen even just in the three years that I've been here, things like phenomenal bankruptcy le legislation getting passed. And as Tarek said, the, the visa issues, all of the ease of doing business legislation that's come out over the, the past few years, that's all set to make things better, but it's all come from those conversations with business that the government is willing to have and, and willing to learn from, right? And um, I do think that there is competition in the region to be this tech hub, although I don't like really saying that there has to be one tech hub, right? There can be a tech hub in one place for health and in one place for agritech and in one place for finance, and they can actually complement each other in, in many ways. But I think the the areas that are going and the countries that are going to succeed are the ones that are going to actually listen to businesses on the ground and like I said learn from them and then adapt the model and change it around and allow people to fail and then move forward right now it's not perfect we still see uh, a lot of issues but it's an open door that we can go in and, and talk to uh, folks like Tarek and Audio at, at any moment, which um, makes us feel really, really good and makes us able to say to US businesses, come here and try because there is, uh, there is a supportive network. There is a government that wants this to succeed uh, and is willing to take the steps to succeed. So yeah, that's in a nutshell. It's a great, great place to be the economic counselor for sure. Thank you, Allison. Uh, and and uh, 
Tarek, uh, we, I had uh, Minister Bintuk uh, on a webinar that the US uh, Commercial Service hosted on Monday and I interviewed him. And he said that the UAE is becoming a brain port, not a seaport, not an airport. You have all those, but now you're becoming a brain port. And I'm listening to everyone on this webinar talk and it sure underscores the point, that point that he made or that phrase that he coined, if you will, on, uh, on Monday. Um, uh, yeah, 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 tell us a little bit about OMET and how you s use this new ecosystem to scale and how you're finding working and living in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, hi, Danny, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. And also, hi, everyone. So, Danny, I think Nadir or Dr. Tariq, they will speak a lot about the process, the system, because this is their baby. But him, I'm the startup that I can confirm or not confirming this. If this is, I'm going to test the water. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put them on the spot. Please, please. Actually, actually uh, I'm going to share with you an interesting thing about my experience. So OMIT, it's a U.S. company, sea delivery company, and we have a subsidiary in France, in Jordan, now in, in Abu Dhabi. So I experienced living in one year in Mountain View. So I was in Silicon Valley. And also we got accepted from F Station in Paris, in France. So we have an office there. And then we have an office also in, in, in Business Park in Jordan, part of uh, the association that SSF is doing. And then we move here in, in, in Abu Dhabi after we got the Hub 71. Frankly speaking, like I moved from all of these city and just set up our business in Abu Dhabi because frankly speaking, what Dr. Tariq said is really correct. Like the, the system that's uh, set up in, 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 in Abu Dhabi is what I call it set up for success. Uh, there is a lot of things that I can bring to the table here. Uh, it's, it's, it's more about access to talent, access to, to, to the fund as well. Uh, even they digitalize everything. So I could make the visa for all of the employees. Everything is online. Like they save a lot of our time here. And also as, as Dr. Tariq you know, mentioned, uh, the way that access to, to the business. So even when we want to uh, use uh, Abu Dhabi as a pilot project, and in Emirates, we could easily do that. So I, 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 I definitely would vote for what has been done so far in, in Abu Dhabi. And it's really blowing all of our mind, in, 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 myself and also my co-founders. Thank you, sir. Um, Danny, do you and, mind, sorry, before and, uh, Danny, do you mind? I want to say congratulations too. Sure. Go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Tarr. Right. So one, I wanted to congratulate uh, yeah, yeah. So sorry, I, I took that out, out of your mouth, but. One thing I did want to say here is that if everything that was in place was running the way that it should be, you would no longer have policy makers, right? You would just have administrators and people that were running things. But we have a lot of policy makers that are still making sure that we are driving forward with changing policy, with benchmarking policy, with making sure that the feedback that Yahya gives, right? Because it, it, it's great to be on here and people to say that, look, the system is working well. What we really benefit from is when we find out what isn't working well and we put those companies in front of the policymakers to make sure that policy is, is sorted. So my job more than anything is policy advocacy. It's helping to take the feedback from startups, from Hub71, from Microsoft, from Allison. And Allison, I have to tell you, and the entire team there at the U.S. Embassy do not hold back which is great, right? <laughs> we get that feedback. Honestly, whether it's on data, whether it's on the way that the cybersecurity is done, the digital side of things, we get that feedback. We work, we engage very, very quickly in terms of trying to come up with solutions. So that's why we still have policymakers. Otherwise, it would just be business as usual and, and, and pushing things forward. So again, it's great to hear that things are moving in the way that they should be. We want more feedback so that we fix even the small things that are not working the way that they should work. Because some policy is old, it's legacy. It needs to be adjusted, it needs to be brought forward. You will have seen the announcements about cohabitation, about alcohol consumption. All of this has been changed recently because we realize it needs to be changed, right? So more of that is coming and we're only going to be able to drive that forward if we have this, um, this two-way narrative and discussion and we take that narrative and we convert it into something that actually applies and works for everybody. So I, I just wanted to add that, Danny, because I think it's nice to hear people compliment the system. It's also really nice when we get feedback that we can use to change things. 
Well, Dr. Tarek, thank you. And, and as Allison and I will tell you, our country is over 230 years old and we still have a lot of policymakers everywhere. So what does that, what, what does that mean, Allison? Uh, we, to your question though, Dr. Tarek, or to your, 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 your plea, there is a question in the chat box uh, that says, Will policies evolve to enable SMEs to participate in tenders? There is a requirement to have a VAT ID, which prohibits startups. Also, the bid bond of 50, or excuse me, five percent, and the service bonds of 33 percent are steep for a startup. Just a quick, quick, quick comment on that because we have a lot of other ground to cover here, sir. Dr. Tar. So the comment is, thanks for providing that information to me. We will come back to you with an answer. If whoever posted that question can provide us with their email address or contact details, we will get back to them and look at that both at the, at the individual level for the, the person asking the question, but then to look to try to address that if it's something that needs to be addressed for everybody. So thank you for putting the question forward. Sure, sure, Dr. Terry. Uh, Nader, tell us a little bit more about Hub71 and your focus there uh, with tech firms uh, and other things. I mean, obviously, Mubadala is a founding partner. You're at ADGM. You're working with companies like Microsoft, uh, but you but you're tapping into a lot of other partnerships as well with leading tech companies and VCs. So just give us a few more words, Natter, and Hub Seventy One, and what it's like to be there. Sure. So so Hub Seventy One is a is a government initiative, right? We launched a couple of years ago. Um, to really enable founders uh, on this earlier stage, so maybe seed and series A, to be able to come to Abu Dhabi, set up, and then grow from there. Correct? So um, we are, uh, Thomas, we work very closely with a lot of partners. Adio is one of them. Uh, we're also backed by Mubadala, the, the, the Abu Dhabi uh, fund, who has a MENA VC um, angle and a MENA VC fund that's focused on uh, MENA funds and Abu Dhabi investments uh, specifically. So really, as, as, a, as a Hub 71, we're focusing on four things. One is access to capital. How can we help uh, founders and startups in the Hub access funds? And we do that through our relationships with the different entities, uh, again, with Mubadala, Adio, ADQ, as well as uh, private VCs. Uh, and there are several of them who are partners with Mubadala and with the fund and with Hub 71 who are keen to engage and, and get access to those startups as well. So you create that interaction mechanism for startups coming into the hub. Um, another element is access to market, which I think Dr. Tarek also mentioned. And we do that very, very well through our partnerships with corporates. So we have a corporate engagement program. Microsoft is uh, part of that and Roberto is a very close partner on this one. Uh, but we also have you know, other, other corporates like Etihad Airlines, um, MasterCard, uh, Aldar, the real estate giant in, in UAE, and a few others. These guys, these are corporates who have very strong and clear innovation mandates and looking to come to the hub and, and look at opportunities with startups to co-create, to create proofs of concept, uh, and, then, and then find commercial opportunities, which would be great for the corporates because they can access innovation. And it's great for the startups because they can access markets quickly in a bigger way and they can go to market uh, in a more streamlined fashion. So that's been a very good program. We just launched um, a series of challenges under Hub 71's umbrella uh, earlier this week with five of those corporates. They brought all brought in challenges, real life challenges that they wanna solve and innovate on. And now we're inviting startups globally to apply to those challenges and then, and then explore uh, those solutions with the corporates. So we invite any startups here to visit us at hub71.com and check out those challenges and see if there's anything that, that they can um, provide value for which is you know, all for, again, connecting those startups with those opportunities. Thirdly, we're, we look, we're very keen about providing talent support. How do you help corporates upskill? How do you help them find talent, right? Whether it's tech talent or, or designers or engineers. Uh, and we do that through linking them with universities, linking them with um, platforms that have those talent uh, listings. And then we create those facilities to help them access that uh, facility. And then of course, fourth is, is the ADGM component, which continues to be a very strong partnership for us and, and on the policymaking side, a very good channel. So um, we do wanna hit startups and see what, they, you know, what issues they're facing, what challenges they're, they're, they're going through. So we can channel that to the right players, put them in front of those player partners and government departments and try to solve those challenges. Yeah, for example, last, last year, we've noticed that a lot of the corporates or the startups coming from outside they're finding issues opening bank accounts. 
something that you know usually you would take for granted or as very trivial. Um, account openings were taking about six months sometimes. So we really got down to it, worked with some of our partners with the central bank, ADGM, Adio even, uh, and started getting into the bottom of the problem. And then with partnerships, with dialogue, with showcasing the opportunity that banks are, are missing by not working with startups, um, we were able now to, uh, with some a few banking partners, open bank accounts within a week or two weeks. And we're talking complex um, shareholding. So these are the kind of issues we're trying to solve and unlock for startups to come, establish, transact, do business. I think finally, Danny, just underlying all that, we offer a set of incentives. It goes to the firepower element that, that Dr. Tarek talked about earlier. We provide incentives to startups who get into the program. Um, those incentives cover housing, they cover insurance, health insurance, and they cover office space uh, for two to three years for a uh, startup that gets into the hub. So we're, take, we're trying to take care of some of that OPEX, get it off their minds so they can focus on building product, focus on transacting, focus on developing business, while, while we help give them that physical platform to, to, to again, operate, uh, access market, access funds, and as well access talent and regulatory support. Nader, thank you so much. Um, Roberto, I want to ask you just uh, uh, on to stay on the issue of, 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 of scale and, and helping the UAE develop skills for the future. I mean, the UAE is developing the reputation as the scale up nation, which is really, really important. Um, what's micro, give us a few words about what you do at Microsoft to help develop the talent pool. And then Allison, I'm going to put you on the spot next to talk a little bit about uh, U.S. government support, if you will, uh, and perspective on U.S. companies coming to the UAE. But go ahead, uh, uh, Roberto, from, from the perspective of scale and developing skills from Microsoft, Microsoft's perspective. Yeah, uh, thank you, Danny, for the question, because it's a, it's a very important topic for us. Uh, we really invest in Double Down here uh, uh, in the UAE to, uh, when it comes to skilling and initiatives to uh, to drive skilling uh, uh, to youth, not only youth, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the pandemic as well, um, you know, people uh, that have, uh, that are finding uh, difficult situations as well, and maybe they are trying to upskill themselves and find a, a better job or, uh, or or new skills as well to to develop. Right. So we we have different initiatives there. So the first thing that we did is uh, we launched our uh, Microsoft Reactor in Abu Dhabi uh, last year. Uh, the reactor used to be a physical space. Uh, we have 11 of, of those reactors globally in, in, um, in strategic locations or in ecosystems where we see uh, you know, a, a thrive env environment of developers, of startups, uh, and so on and so forth. So we decided to invest in Abu Dhabi, uh, despite the fact that the ecosystem is being built as we speak, right? So it was, it was, it was really an investment in and in, in believing that this could, could, could happen and, and contributing to make this happen. The, the reactor is a physical space, used to be a physical space where we host, you know, hackathons, code labs, workshops, trainings, and so on and so forth. With COVID, it turned into a virtual experience for the time being. Um, so uh, we are able to extend uh, uh, more easily probably the impact of these skilling initiatives across, across the Middle East and Africa region uh, as a hub from here. Um, which is great because there is a lot of talent, a lot of young uh, uh, population that um, you know can build on those skills, can leverage those skills to either start a company, you know, build a tech startup, or uh, go into corporates and bring that growth mindset that is part of our, our culture as well. Whenever we have skilling initiatives, that that is really important. So we need to have people that are curious, people that uh, you know are out there to to learn and have the right mindset, the right attitude, even if they join a corporate, not just launch a, launch a new business. So for us, the reactor is a key investment in the region. Uh, and looking longer term, uh, this is one of the initiatives that we. Um, we, we agreed in our partnership with Abu Dhabi Investment Office as well is we, we really want to uh, contribute to inspiring youth and change or uh, evolve the mindset uh, uh, when it comes for youth across uh, the Middle East and Africa uh, uh, and entrepreneurship. We believe entrepreneurship is a mindset. We, we have a, a big ambition of touching a million uh, students and a million people that will be uh, identified as youth and from there, uh, you know, build a funnel. Not all of these million people will become entrepreneurs. That's not the objective. 
um, but at least they will get out of this with, with some sort of skilling and certificate that will be definitely linked to employability. But then from there, we really want to build the funnels because uh, you know, out of those million people in four to five years, uh, there will be ideas that uh, then will go down the funnel, right? To be incubated, accelerated, and, and become uh, a few of those who definitely become becoming successful. Excellent, so, excellent, excellent. That's that's really fantastic. You guys are really at the top of your game there, Allison. You know, there's a wonderful story by Microsoft. T talk a little bit about some other American companies and what you're doing at the U.S. Mission, broadly speaking, to help and assist, and what you would say to them. And then we'll come back to uh, Yahya for a few words. Sure. Um, so, you know, we talked to a lot of the big, uh, the U.S. tech giants, right, who are here and, and they're quite happy. They, they like the infrastructure. Uh, they know that the, that the environment is good for them here. But then we talked to a lot of smaller startups in the tech field and they tell us three things consistently. And um, Tarek has, has heard us say this many times, um, but that's why he's such a strong partner is because we can um, share these concerns that we have uh, with, with him and with the uh, Emirati government in general. And th those are IPR. Um, we have a lot of small tech companies who are worried about losing um, trade secret protection. They're worried about um, big fees in order to file for uh, patent registration things like that. And these, this is a sign of a, a growing economy and the UAE is working on it, but it's definitely an issue that gives a lot of SMEs pause before they come here. Also concerns about data privacy um, and what the uh, UAE government is going to decide as uh, which mode is going to follow um, for data privacy. Any company that's coming in the tech sphere is going to have concerns about that. And then we have a lot of um, women who are in the tech field and wanting to come and set up uh, regionally, and they ask about women's economic empowerment. And you know, we're able to uh, tell them that there's a lot of great initiatives um, in the UAE to uh, improve women, especially in the, in the tech field. Uh, we partner with the UAE on a lot of those programs. Uh, we just did the Academy of Women Entrepreneurs, for example, and we're going to work on the Google Tech Makers program, uh, uh, which is coming up. So there's a, a lot of great um, initiatives, but there's also not a lot of easy mechanisms for businesses to show corporate social responsibility, for example, or um, just that they're working with a gender friendly business. So we're trying to bring we connect, for example, to the UAE so that we can verify that a, that a company is gender friendly. Those kinds of issues are the ones that, that come up most often and sort of stop the smaller businesses and give them a little bit of pause before coming to the region. Um, but they're all issues that the UAE is working on and um, they're all things that we're happy to give feedback on as well. Now, now Allison, uh, tell me, I just read yesterday or the day before that there's a new law in the UAE that requires a female on every board of directors. Do we have something like that in the United States that requires a woman to be on the board? We do not. We do um, not. What we do, what we do is a lot of state legislators have um, corporate social responsibility programs in place. Right. And that's what we want to see here more. Um, so you're absolutely right. This is uh, this is not something that is unique to the UAE by any means, uh, but doesn't mean that we can't, you know, still ask Tarek to keep working on it. I agree 100%. I just think it's an incredible step forward when you see, uh, you know, in the Middle East region with all the misconceptions about it, when you see a law like that come forward, it's it's a very it's very very important and very significant. Yeah, yeah, we have a few minutes left, and then I want to come back to a bigger question about Israel and the Abraham Accords to end on. But yeah, yeah, tell us, give us a little bit of sense of, um, of from from you being a startup there, your sense of the future, what you're ex what you think's going to come, what you're excited about, what you're looking forward to, please. Yeah, so actually, Danny, uh, in a startup, uh, what you really need in order. Uh, let's say to scale your business uh, like uh, in, in other region is like four things. First of all, you need access to talent, you need access to market, access to a uh, fund and access to network. Uh, what I can see that uh, the thing that we already have it here in, 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 in Abu Dhabi that let's say solving all of it. So eventually 
uh, I'm really feeling very, let's say, promising of uh, having us here in Abu Dhabi because, like, we 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 have already now closed our B Series A by accessing to the fund in 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 in, in Abu Dhabi by an institutional fund here uh, called Shuru VC, and that's also helping us to scale more in other region. Plus, also Hub Seventy One give us the access of the network. So eventually, you know, while we are in Hub Seventy One, you will meet a lot of you know people as as you all of you know that now also I'm going to be joining to 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 the Hub Seventy One a lot of tech. So I'm, 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 let's say the, the things I feel about all what's happening here in, in Abu Dhabi, I'm really feeling uh, very, uh, you know, uh, optimistic in the futures. I see uh, things working on the right directions. I do believe that uh, in a way or another, Abu Dhabi as, uh, as, as, as a tech hub is, is going there. And yeah, I mean, we are really excited as a startup to be part of this journey. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Tarek Allison, uh, I've been working closely with Israel for my entire career, almost going on 40 years now. And many American companies, the US government for that matter, have always siloed our, our discussions, our cooperation with the, the, the part of the company that deals with Israel and the part of the company that deals with the Arab states. Now the walls have come down uh, with the Abraham, the historic Abraham Accords of August 2020. And, and that were signed in September of 2020, issuing in this new era of collaboration in the Middle East. Just a word or two from each of you on the possibility, the opportunity, a company like Microsoft that has a major facility in Israel, has major facility in the UAE, now being able to work together, bring it all together inside the company. Dr. Tarek, Allison, your thoughts on the, on the future of the Abraham Accords and what it means. Allison, do you want to go first? Because I feel like I might have to like uh, defend myself after you have a go. At this. No, you, that's good, Dr. <laughs> Tarek. You can have the last word. Go ahead, Allison. All right, sure. Thanks, Tarek. Um, yeah, the Abraham Accords are amazing, right? You know, I was posted in Jerusalem ten years ago, and I would have never said I would have seen something like this. And I think uh, the reason why we're seeing it is because the time is right. Uh, the, we've you know, gone to a younger generation. There are uh, people who are looking at the opportunities that the Abraham Accords presents. And uh, frankly, I was in uh, Dubai over New Year's and I thought I was back at my old posting in Jerusalem. There were just so many uh, Israeli tourists there and it was wonderful to see. Um, the business opportunities, I think, were just uh, waiting and ready to happen. And, and now we'll see them come to fruition. And the magic uh, that we see is um, areas where Israel has just a decade or so more experience in, in tech or in the um, sort of science behind something that the UAE has wanted to do for a while. And the joining of that partnership between the infrastructure here and the ability for Israel to come in and then launch to other parts of the region, uh, it's going to be mind boggling. And I, I'm really, really looking forward to seeing it. Thank you, Dr. Tarek. Yeah, I, I'd agree uh, entirely with what Allison just said. I think one thing that I'll add is that now these bilateral relations are going to turn into this really wonderful trilateral relation here in terms of how it is that we connect what has happened indirectly for so long and now become very direct in terms of what the Abraham Accords afford. I think if I look at what it is that the Accords actually, what they've done is that over the six, the initial six months, and now we're moving to that seventh month where I think that, you know, that, that um, initial phase of trying to understand, was this going to be a relationship of capital flowing one way and technology flowing the other, or was this going to be something that was a little more symbiotic in terms of really building something together? And I think a lot of the conversations that we started with were, we want to be first to do this. And now what it is that we're doing is like, we want to be first and we want to be in, in, in Abu Dhabi. And we want to be in Israel. We just opened up our office in um, in Tel Aviv, and it's uh, it's going really, really well in terms of having that exposure there. And so I think that the Abraham Accords present us with an immense opportunity to be able to sit around the same table, exchange ideas, try to find common solutions to problems that have existed for a very long time for everyone in the region. And now we can sit there and have a proper discussion, both from a corporate perspective. So driving that economy forward, and if we get that economy uh, driving the right way, 
uh, between all of us, it's going to lead to that social change that you want and strengthening of political ties and really making it a whole wholesome uh, relationship. And I think it's the economy that dictates a lot of these things and the, the economic relations that you build uh, between countries. It's, it's so, so true and so right. And the people to people ties are gonna, are, as Allison mentioned with the, with the visitors to, um, um, the UAE at, at, over the holidays are just going to come faster and faster and faster. And it, it is an ecosystem. It is a synergy, if you will. And it's so critically important to the region. But Danny, it's beyond that. If I, if I may interject, if I Please. may jump, it's beyond that. And, and I, this, this particular subject is incredibly important to me because what we've done is that you've created hope in a region where there was a narrative that was perpetuating for a very long time. That doesn't mean that the problems will be resolved immediately. But what that means is that we are actually having a discussion now amongst each other as peers, as colleagues, as friends, as political allies, and as business partners. And I think once you're able to address every part of that aspect, you can have a much more fruitful conversation. And so what you've done is you've provided the youth in this region, which forms the, the major part of the demographic structure in our region, with that hope with the understanding that, wow, if we can overcome differences that have existed for 70, 80 years, right, that anything else is possible. And this is what startups effectively are doing here, right? Anything is possible. They're coming in, they're disrupting, they're doing different things. And so that's why we want to be able to support that. That's why it is that we want to form new allegiances and alliances and partnerships. And the Abraham Accords afford that to us. And our relationship with the U.S. does as well. And we want to help support all of those companies, which will ultimately feed down to creating jobs for people and help guys like Yahya be able to sort the, source the best talent from truly around the region, right? Dr. Tarek, I, I, you, I couldn't say it better. Uh, as Allison alluded to, we've spent our careers in the US government trying to work to help create opportunity for Israelis and Arabs to come together. You guys have done it. It's amazing. Uh, bravo, as, uh, as the Italians might say, bravo, bravo, bravo. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our, our session. Thank you very much to everyone, to our speakers, uh, to, to, to Your Excellency Dr. Tarek. We very much appreciate your time today. Um, I just want to quickly say that in the next week or so, we're going to have a webinar with Dubai's Vaccine Logistics Alliance and the HOPE Consortium talking about uh, COVID vaccine distribution. We will have a webinar on March 24th on Abu Dhabi's Hydrogen Alliance. We're going to have a virtual trade mission from New Jersey to the UAE webinar on March 24th, and we're working on a China Gulf webinar and a webinar on food security in the UAE all in early April. So a lot of activity, a lot going on, and we couldn't do it without great partners and speakers like you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Have a wonderful evening in the UAE and the Middle East and a wonderful day in the United States. Goodbye.